and good evening. My name is Sandra Lopez and you're watching Movement News, Chicagoland's newest grassroots media organization committed to the presentation of local Chicagoland news, updates, and narratives. We aim to present stories that represent you and your local community. Welcome to the movement. So we're going to start off today with some local news and updates. Oop, wrong button. All right, so in Illinois, uh, Illinois election officials erroneously canceled voter registrations for over 744 ex-convicts. On Monday, local authorities were informed that 744 former Illinois Department of Correction inmates may have had their voter registrations mistakenly canceled, according to the State of the Board elections. It appears that the issue was detected this past November, which affected voters in more than half of the state's 108 local jurisdictions, election jurisdictions, excuse me. The former inmates were incorrectly categorized as still being incarcerated after registering to vote upon the completion of their sentences. According to spokesperson Matt Dietrich, it will be up to local election authorities to review the cancellations and determine if any should be reinstated. Some may have had their registration canceled by local authorities as part of routine maintenance of the voter rolls, said Mike Matt Dietrich. Oh, there you go. <laughs> While people are eligible to vote upon completing their prison, their prison sentence, they are required to re-register before casting a ballot. The mistaken cancellations affected people who had registered after their sentences were over. The State Board of Elections on Monday blamed a data matching error with the Department of Corrections. In Illinois, the voting rights of inmates convicted of crimes are suspended during incarceration, but they're restored upon release. Registrations are being reviewed for reinstatement by this Thursday, right before early voting starts for Illinois, Illinois' is March 17th primary. We're going to go ahead and move over to some international news. The coronavirus outbreak is now a global health emergency. Just as the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency, over 12,627 cases in mainland China have been confirmed, nearly 23,000 cases worldwide, and over 490 people have lost their lives. Though the number of reported cases continues to grow, there has been praise for the Chinese government's handling of the outbreak. Dr. Carlos Del Rio, professor of medicine and global health at Emory University, stated in an interview with CNN, I think China responded much more rapidly and effectively than it did in 2002 to the SARS outbreak. You can still say that maybe there were delays here or there, but I would say that China's response has been really remarkable and quite frankly unprecedented. I think they learned a lot from SARS and I think they are applying those lessons in controlling this outbreak. Even as the corona coronavirus continues to spread, World health officials urge the public to invest in preparedness and not panic. The spread of misinformation further pushes fear, which, according to Dr. Carlos del Rio, is the most problematic contagion. In the U.S., the Trump administration declared the coronavirus a public health emergency and announced that certain foreign nationals deemed to pose a risk of transmitting the disease would be temporarily denied entry to the United States. Some returning American citizens potentially at risk will be quarantined. Public health officials say that they are trying to contain the infection, which has sickened 11 U.S. citizens, before it spreads too quickly. Over in Mexico, tragedy befalls Mexico's butterfly sanctuary. Just days after the funeral of activist Homero Gomez Gonzalez, a second worker in Mexico's monarch butterfly sanctuary has been found. This past Saturday, the body of Raul Hernandez Romero, a part-time tour guide, was found with injuries that appear to have been inflicted by a sharp object. 
according to prosecutors in the western state of Michoacán. Conservationists fear that his death may be linked to that of Homero Gomez, manager of El Rosario Monarch Reserve, whose body was found, was discovered in a well on January 29th. Prior to the discovery of Homero Gomez's body, Mr. Gomez was reported missing for nearly two weeks. His family said that prior to his disappearance, the activists had received threats warning him to stop campaigning against illegal logging. Homero Gomez was a tireless campaigner for the conservation of monarch butterflies and the pine and fir forest wherein they hibernated. The sanctuary that he managed opened just last November as part of a strategy to stop illegal logging in the key habitat for the species. In this image, flower petals fall as family and friends grieve around the grave of community activist Homero Gomez Gonzalez in Michoacán, Mexico this past Friday. In the second image, Rebecca Valencia Gonzalez, um, Homero Gonza Gomez Gonzalez's wife, is holding up a picture of her husband in their home in Ocampo, Michoacán, Mexico. Relatives of the anti-logging activist who fought to protect the winter habitat of monarch butterflies don't know whether he was murdered or if he had died accidentally. But they do say that they do know one thing for sure, something bad is happening to the rights and the environmental activists in Mexico, and people are afraid. As mentioned, Homero Gomez was an activist and a community, a community organizer, a dangerous profession in Mexico. A London-based global witness counted 15 killings in environmental activists in Mexico um, in 2017, 14 in 2008. And just last October of 2019, Amnesty International said that 12 had been killed in the first nine months of 2019. Members of the community are demanding justice from local authorities who have given no other information on Homero Gomez's injuries and did not say how it might have been inflicted. Authorities have mentioned, however, an ongoing investigation suggesting that the case may not suggesting the case may not have been considered an accident. Now we're going to move a little closer to the border, um, towards the border town of Juarez, Juarez, Mexico. Isabel Cabanillas uh, was murdered in the city of Juarez, Chihuahua. She was a beloved 26-year-old feminist, activist, and artist. And her name was Isabel Cabanillas, and Isabel Cabanillas who was assassinated in Ciudad Juarez just um, on Saturday, January 18th, excuse me. Cabanillas was reported missing on social media by her friends after never returning home. That same day, she was found shot to death on a sidewalk next to her bicycle in down downtown Juarez. The murder of Cabanillas highlights the endemic issue of femicide in Ciudad Juarez. In 2019, Maria Salguero designed a map that detailed the number of women who were murdered that same year. The study, published by local newspaper El Rado de Mexico, revealed that at least 311 women were murdered in Juarez in the last three years, and that 3,835 women were murdered in total all throughout Mexico. And this is uh, the map of murders in Mexico. As mentioned, this is of 2019. Ni una más, ni una más, ni una más asesinada, women chanted on Sunday, according to El Paso Times. Not one more, not one more, not one more murder. In January 2020 alone, seven women have been found murdered in Mexico, according to a spokesperson for feminist collective Hijas de su Maquilera Madre. The collective has been vocal about Cabanillas' case and have publicly decried the state's lack of responsibility when it comes to protecting women as well as activists. In Juarez, the violence has not stopped. If the community does not come together, we will never be heard. Isabel was a victim of the very violence she fought against. As well as an activist, she was a mom, a sister, and a friend. On average, 
10 women are murdered every day in Mexico, making it one of the most dangerous countries in the world for women. Only one of every 10 reported crimes in Mexico results in jail time. Women and allies dressed in black with pink signage and masks gathered at the Paso del Norte International Bridge between border cities and blocked it off for at least three hours just last week. A few protesters even laid in fake pools of blood. Gavanias is survived by her four-year-old son. And we are now going to move on to politics 2020, election 2020. As many of you know, tonight is President Trump's State of the Union address. This evening, President Trump will be giving his third State of the Union address in Washington as his impeachment trial continues. The final vote in the Senate trial to acquit Trump, to likely acquit Trump, uh, will likely come tomorrow with lawmakers absent from the address, including some of the earliest and most fervent supporters of his impeachment. Democratic Representative Steve Cohen of Tennessee, who introduced articles of impeachment against Trump in 2017, skipped the last two State of the Union addresses, stating that he had no intention of going in a very cold room to hear a bunch of puff and lies. Female Democrats are reprising the coordinated suffragist white to tonight's address. Last year, the women legislators dressed in white to make a striking visual statement about the Trump administration's handling of important, important issues that affect women, from health care to equal pay. Last year, Trump's tenure in the White House also coincided with, coincided with the Me Too movement and the Women's March. Lois Frankel, a Democratic representative from the state of Florida and the co-chairwoman of, of the Democratic Women's Caucus, said that I think it's important to be there. The country is watching. I want them to know that, that we are there and that we are sending a message that we are fighting back and we're fighting for the people. And that is happening tonight. And now we're going to go ahead and move over to the Iowa Caucus. Uh, which also happened yesterday and was a little crazy. Um, the Iowa caucus was just yesterday and of course as I just mentioned, wow. Honestly, all we can say here is wow. Um, after a full day of the official results, at 4 p.m. Central Time, the DNC finally held a press conference. However, we seem to be left with a lot more questions than any answers. And to be honest, there's, there's still no clear winner. Um, clear winner and only 60% of precinct voting has been reported. Our analysis? It seems like the news cycle has moved to New Hampshire and the electorate has been denied the truth. But since we're the grassroots media, we managed to find the important stories of the day. So check it out. Our very own Sarah Walker spent the day in Muscatine, where the first ever Spanish language caucus was held. The population of Iowa is 91% white, but has a growing Latino community that represents 6% of the state. For the first time in the history of the Democratic Party, six satellite caucus locations were conducted in Spanish in an attempt to increase Latino voter participation. At the site in Muscatine, Representatives for Biden, Sanders, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and Yang all made their case for why their candidate was the best choice. The Warren campaign did not send any representatives to this site. In the end, Sanders, is overwhelm Sanders overwhelmingly won all eight delegates of the site and was the only viable candidate. Upon realignment, all other caucus goers declined to choose a second preference. Sarah is here with us today to give us some more detailed background of what happened on the ground of Iowa. So hi, Sarah. Hi, Sandra. How are you Thank doing Thank you today? so much for coming today. I'm great. How are you? Good. I'm glad to be here on the side of the camera tonight. 
Fabulous. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to speak a little bit about what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the Iowa caucus? Um, just kind of back it up and tell us what that's all about. Yeah, so I went and I had no idea what a caucus would be like. I've never been to a caucus and I didn't know what to expect. But basically, the voters of Iowa, they go and they publicly declare their preference, their first preference for president. And they do that in an open um, c community forum type mm -hmm. situation. And different representatives from each candid uh, candidacy can come and, and explain to the voters why they should go with them. Um, they do that, that's like the first round. And at every precinct is different because of the population. So it's a certain, you have to get at least 15% of the votes in order to be what's considered viable. So if your candidate doesn't receive that 15%, then they're not viable and you have to choose another candidate or you can abstain and not vote in the second round. Um, so it was interesting to see. It was kind of chaotic, um, but it was fun to see and it was interesting to see. Um, and so I'm glad I went and, and got that footage and learned what it was about. Right, and you mentioned that uh, there was a Spanish, excuse me, a Spanish language caucus. Can you give me a little background on that as well? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It was pretty much Spanglish. It turned, yeah. you know, it always turns into Spanglish. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, so it's historic for the first time in the history of the Democratic Party, but in the history of the nation, there were six satellite locations that were Spanish only, and. Um, that's never happened before. So they, it was in, it was to get out the Latino vote. Local groups uh, on the ground have been fighting to get those because, you know, I, I realized when I got there, yeah, of course, if there's not places that are in your native language, why would you be comfortable going to caucus? So, um, so it's brand new, it's revolutionary, it's meant to get the Latino vote out. And um, they also had, in addition to that, they had um, site satellite locations at mosques to nice. uh, make the, uh, the Muslim community feel more comfortable as well. So very historic and um, it was amazing to see. Fabulous. What was the turnout for the Spanish language caucus? So the Thanks. one, uh, there's six, I don't have numbers on mm -hmm. who all came out, but at mine there was nearly a hundred people who came. Uh-huh. And, um, and all of, almost all of them were first time voters or first time in a long time voters. So they were there registering to vote on site. Over 75 of those voters um, registered on site that day. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's huge. That's amazing. It was very cool. Yeah. So what did you observe being out there? I mean, of course, that massive turnout, but what else did you observe? Right. So th it was pretty stark, the win that Bernie Sanders had at the site that I was at. I believe that he won them all in the state. Uh, I don't think he swept them like the, in all of them like he did in the, at the than like the one I was at, the satellite location mm -hmm. I was at. Um, what struck me was uh, how overwhelming that was and what I learned from working with the groups, the local groups there and talking to them about how this all came about and um, you know why they were either with Bernie or whoever. The Bernie Sanders campaign started reaching out to those groups last March, March of 2019. And only in the last couple weeks were any of the other candidacies reaching out to them, and some didn't reach out at all. Mm. So that was really, um, really remarkable uh, to see that overwhelming. And I mean, not just um, not just supporting the Sanders campaign, but very, very excited uh, to be a part of it and um, run by mostly young people as well, right. which was very cool. Another interesting thing was that uh, they offered childcare because they want it to be culturally uh, comfortable for everybody. So, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the Latino community often brings their children uh, when they go anywhere, and um, that can, when there's places that don't allow children, or you can be discouraged from bringing your children, um, that makes it more difficult to participate. So they had that in addition to it being Spanish language. Right, so it's very inclusive. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, and you were there, she was really there all weekend, which is yep. amazing. So you really got to see it kind of in all, from all angles. Really. Right, yeah. She actually just returned this afternoon. I got amazing. back about an hour ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so the results of the Muscatine Caucus had the Sanders campaign winning decisively. What's your analysis of this? So 
like you know, like I said, um, it has to do with because he his campaign put in the work in that community and gave that community the respect that it deserves. You know, to come for the other candidates to either not ever reach out or to reach out at the eleventh hour. Um, that's going to obviously come across as disrespectful, and it's obviously going to come across as pandering. And the Sanders campaign clearly did the work to uh, make that true relationship with that community there in Muscatine. And um, yeah, so I mean, he put the work in, he showed the respect, and he won them over with his with the policies that 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 he's uh, that he's pitching. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And. You know, I think yesterday's, everyone can agree on that. It was a very historic um, caucus. Um, what does that mean for, for the election cycle? What do you think that says about New Hampshire or, or moving forward? I'm still trying to process it myself. Um, but the, at the very least, we, we've seen a Democratic Party that at Best case scenario is wildly incompetent. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess that's all. That's our best case scenario. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> all right, I got it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead. If you're interested in learning um, more about our organization, you can follow us online. And we actually don't have that slide yet. But um, let me back it up, actually. So all of the issues that we discussed, including uh, issues regarding the Iowa caucus, the election cycle, um, really are affected by voter 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 participation. Excuse me. All the issues we discussed on this episode are directly um, related to voter participation. The laws that affect our lives are written by those that we elect to serve in office. So if you would like to register to vote. Oh, you can go ahead um, on, on the Illinois primary website at ova.elections.il.gov. Our Illinois primary is on March 17th. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, as I mentioned, all these issues that we've discussed on this episode are directly related to voter participation. If you would like to learn more about um, movement news, about what what news we're covering for the week or what we have to say, you can go ahead and follow us online uh, at Mass Movement Media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Bueno, tengo los resultados, como les dije. Eh, Bernie son 72 votos. Sí. Sí, sí, pueden aplaudir. Sí, cinco votos. Joe Biden, uno. Andrew, dos. Y uno sin decidirse. Así que tenemos un, un viable, que es Bernie Sanders. Ahora tenemos que hacer un segundo alineamiento y ellos tienen que decidir si se vienen para acá o no. We have one, one viable, and you all have to decide if you come over here or not. Join us. Or if you join us. We do a realignment.